insects. So, every, like as I mentioned, everything in nature is made of chitin. This is her building block. This is how she does this. So, the, like I say, the, anything on an insect, a hard part, will be made of chitin. So, as I mentioned, chitinase is one of the phytoalexins that your plant will produce naturally if it's under an attack, anything like that. Um, chitinase, as I mentioned, is what nature uses to tear down chitin and chitazan. So when you spray this on, we kind of mimic that. The plant actually kicks in chitinase production and being one of these things. So now anything that bites, chews, or sucks on the plant will either be repelled because insects will instantly recognize chitinase. Anything that's been ever through a molting process or anything that way, that molt, that shell that it hides in, hibernates in, will be made of chitin. In order for the insect to have escaped that and move on with life, the insect actually has to exude some chitinase to soften that to be able to break out of it. So we get the chitinase levels up in the plant. The first thing that happens is the insects are repelled by this because they recognize this and they know what will happen. If they're brave enough to continue on with this, as soon as they take a bite and come in contact with the chitinase, it will just start to tear them down. The stylet will go limp on a piercing sucking insect. This is where we'll get into with the nematode stuff here, the mouth parts, the hard parts in a nematode. As soon as they come in contact, they will take a bite. It, lack of a better explanation, will basically give them mouth cancer and they limp off and die horribly, which is good on pathogenic nematodes. Uh, grasshoppers, we saw this, I'll have a, I don't know if I got that in here or not. I've seen, we did some stuff on a pea field last year for an Ascochyta blight infestation. And I was out walking a few days later looking at it and was kind of shocked at the, uh, I had, like he didn't have a, really an insect infestation at all, but I was shocked to see how many dead grasshoppers you'd find scattered here and there. And I'll have a picture here too of the loopers. And I couldn't figure out the loopers weren't necessarily dead. Some of them were, some of them seemed perfectly healthy, some of them were just bloated up. And, and I couldn't figure out why all the loopers are on the ground where there's nothing for them rather than in the foliage. So I actually had to call Robin with uh, these guys and explain the situation to him. And he says, well, Tom, he says, yeah, if you just did the application 24 hours ago, he says, they have probably all dropped off the plant either from the repulsion of the, of the enzyme or they've taken a bite and they're now on the ground starving to death. So it, it has some pretty fantastic insecticidal properties to it. I missed a prime opportunity on a test plot on a dry farm last summer. I went up and sprayed some test strips of the O2YS out on a Thursday. On a Thursday, and by Saturday I realized that I had a uh, cereal leaf beetle infestation coming in. Had I recognized that it was there a couple days prior, I would have moved my test plots over right onto them. But I realized this on a Saturday, it was Tuesday before we got back up to spray. And it was interesting because by then you'd see the white patch starting to grow across the field. It kind of starts in a point and then it broadens out as they move the infestation. It stopped right at the line where I had sprayed the chitazan. It kind of came to a point right there. I was really tempted to give it another couple of days to see how far they would go, but the farmer in me wouldn't let the scientist in me do that one, so we just sprayed them to kill them. But it certainly seems to have some very impressive insecticidal properties. Nematodes. So as we've kind of discussed already, the, the hard mouth parts in a nematode. So we spray this out on the soil and uh, I'm going to borrow your board here, Ken. So we'll spray chitazan onto the field. And it's going to come in contact with, there's two terms here, there's chitinolytic and chitazanolytic. I use chitinolytic because it saves me a couple of syllables. Um, to be classified in that, basically, they have to produce this enzyme chitinase. And I'll, most of they've got a slide here in a few minutes. A lot of your good guys will fall into this classification already. It's just another one of the magic things that a lot of these guys do. But anyway, when we put the chitazan down, it uh, inspires all of these little organisms, our chitinolytics. 
So these um, Pseudomonas, Trichoderma, Trichoderma harzianum is your biggest, baddest chitinase producer that science has been able to identify yet. As we've kind of all been through here today, like science doesn't know a lot about this, but they, uh, those are, that's your biggest one. So it comes in contact with the chitinolytic organisms. These are the guys that are responsible to break that down. They turn us into chitinase. Okay, the chitinase now, so we put this big concentration of chitazan on. Same thing happens in the ocean now. We've inspired this whole subclass of organisms that they, they have to come to work. They have a job to do now. They all got woke up. We kind of take this and turn it into a very specific food source for the microbes. We've tried to grow, we've tried to populate, we've done everything we can for these. We're gonna put these guys to work now and get our money back out of them. So they go to work exuding this enzyme chitinase. As the chitinase moves out through the soil, anything that comes in contact with it now, uh, exoskeleton, wire worms, basically any of your pathogenic insects, anything you're going to encounter, um, chitinase is going to give them a really, really bad day. Spider mites. Spider mites, yes. So the other cool thing, so now the chitinase will start to be taken back up by the plant up here. So it hits the plant roots and this just blew the chitinase level through the plant. We just took the plant self-defense to a whole, whole new plane, whole nother level. Because chitinase, remember, is one of the phytoalexins. This is one of the things a plant will produce in response to a stimuli. So we just gave it basically the raw product. We just sent this shooting all through the plant. Um, the product is Xylem Flow Mobile. You can put it down. It will come up in the foliage and work for insects. You can spray it on the foliage. It will take it back down and it will work for the nematodes. Our experience playing with this last couple of years, because it just has such a big area of usage, wide range of stuff, you kind of want to keep in mind what you're after. If you want after stuff in the dirt, spray it on the dirt. If you're after the plant protection side of it, you're going to get a bigger kick out of this on the foliage side of things. So. So why should I use it? Here's some kind of slides showing what happened here. So this is our friend Jose, works with us over in the uh, western side of the state mountain home. And this is Mr. Rockstar himself over here. So this was on a sugar... Pounds ago. Yeah, that was Mark 75 pounds ago. Like I didn't hardly recognize him yesterday. It's kind of hard to tell in these. Uh, I've th got a close-up picture. I'll show you those bees. Anybody that's concerned, I've got it on my phone. It's, it's pretty remarkable. If the, yeah, the lighting stuff in here, this side, the, the, the color is obviously different. It's, it's way greener over here than it is on this side. This was the only thing they did different was the, the Kytazan product that they put on. Just one application also. One app. And what was the sugar level difference? Do you remember in the? 24%. They had a 24% higher sugar level with one pint of O2YS. Yeah, and I'm, and guys, when I talk, I'm only gonna talk for 10 minutes, but I'm gonna, cover just a couple of the high spots that I've heard other people talk about and just I'll make it real simple for you. So These were some white beans that Jose was trying this on over there. You can tell here Mark's holding two plants out of the one side, two plants out of the other side. The foliage difference is just astronomical, night and day difference. Again, one application. This was off my stuff on the dry farm last year, and I wasn't planning to do, I was just up digging one day, walking fields, seeing what was going on, curious. So anyway, I got out the shovel, I was actually looking for moisture, and I dug plants out of this section first, and I was baffled at the root mass that this dry land wheat had produced. So then I got, so I was up digging roots, and one thing I got thinking, well, yeah, I'll just put some in the bucket here, take them home so I can wash them, I'm not destroying everything. So, and then I had to go find me a, so this one on the left, I had to actually sneak over to the neighbor's field to see how it compared with everything. This is a conventional seed treatment, pink stuff that everybody, everybody uses. This one here, when we got to the tail end of planting last year, we had run out of seed. I was too busy marking spud rows to come home and treat any more seed for my dad to go plant for me. So that plant there got absolutely nothing. These two over here is this combination the soil biology boost with the bio-release and the O2IS. So it was 1.6 ounces of the soil biology boost. I think we were doing eight ounces of the bio-release. And I actually put a pint per hundred weight of O2IS on the seed last year. 
basically because we ran out of time. So we didn't have time to go spray everything like we had the year before. I actually sprayed my first Roundup again last spring for the first time in five years because I just didn't have time. The spud mark out thing was so early last year. So to try to replicate this, we didn't know what else to do. So we literally, we put a pint per hundred weight on our wheat seed and barley seed and put out last year. It was, it was, it was wheat soup coming out the end of the auger and within 30 minutes, everything had soaked everything up. Based on this and some stuff we saw out here in the Hibbard country, we feel like that uh, it still it shed off the kaitazan. We still feel like we got the effects of the pint per hundred we did, the or pint per acre we did the year before. But yeah, and if the lighting was better, why well, you can even see right in this area, there's some black stem canker coming in both of these that really not a lot of, not a lot of difference between those two. The only difference here, this came from the north end of the field, this one came from the south end of the field, but these got the full, the full shot. Borrowed this one from Ken. This is one of his farmers in Montana. This was on some organic chickpeas last year. They planted them. They had a fusarium infection show Ascochita. up in them. What's that? Ascochita. Oh, it's Ascochita. Not sure what to do, so Ken ran some stuff up to him and a pint per acre of the 01, a pint of Foliar Micro Boost, is that it? And a pint of Bio Release. So they sent this seed in for testing to see what their disease stuff was. If you can read those, Ascochita, Botrytis, Anthracnose, Fusarium, everything there, 0.0. .0. They came back absolutely clean with a 96% germ rate. This was kind of a rescue mission, because if I recall correctly, these were organic and they didn't really have any other products available to them at the moment. A lot of money on the line. Chickpeas are well over 100 bucks an acre to put a crop in. Organic's worth more than that on the harvest end, so it's pretty tickled with that one. So kind of jumping to the nemasan side of things, the nematode portion. A few things I want to kind of draw your attention to here. From this slide to the next slide, I want you to notice the date. This was on 725 that we pulled these samples. This was pre-application. So on this side is the Nemasan and oh I forgot to block the anyway. This side is the competitive product. This was a pivot that was split in half. We put the Nemasan program on one side. They used their conventional program they were using on the other side. As of the 25th of July, we're over here, we're at 10 Columbia's 920 on uh, Stubby, stunt, basically we're after Columbia here, 20 over here, 980, like there's not a lot of difference here. There's been a couple applications of each product made at this point in the season. We are holding our own, we felt pretty good about this. So again, note the dates on this because this one's gonna be an eye opener. So now we get into August 7th is when we pulled these. This was post-treatment on the same, they did conventional, we did our test here. But things went through the roof. I'm sure we've all hit here and heard the bite date spill this spring and how we've got to, we got to clock the numbers at 800 degree days and at 1400 is when the second hatch comes out and things blow up. This is what happens. So we're two weeks later here we went from, so on our side over here, we went from 10 Columbia to 180 Columbia. And at first I was a little discouraged, like this made absolutely no sense. We got over here to the other one, so we started out over here at 20 Columbia, went to 2600 Columbia in 14 days. This is what they do at 1400 degree day, growing degree days. These pop, you're into your second, get into your third generation now, they explode. So when I figured this out on a percentage basis, on our side over here, we actually had a 1200% increase. This one over here, they had a 17,000% increase in 14 days. So kind of the takeaway overall general thing here, just wanted you guys to be aware of is if you're going with the Bidate, whatever program you use, Bellum, Bidate, Nemasan, the timing dates are critical on this. And when these guys have kind of went through and clocked this out for nematode cycles and growing degree days, like pay attention to that. You need to be ahead of this to try to club that before they blow up and the population escapes because they, uh, they go fast. Uh, this one, yeah, this one was out off the Egen bench. These don't show up very well at all. 
This was a side by side. This pivot, they vape panned the whole thing the fall prior. Um, the, the side of it that they put us on, the north half, was known to have some stubby root problems. They had came out with some quirky ring spot on numerous occasions on this. So they put us on the north half of it. The south half, I don't think, got anything other than just Baypam all summer. So on our side where it says Nemesan, this is actually a Nemesan and Baypam program. And this one over here was just the straight Baypam. So over here, they came up with virtually nothing for Columbia's. We came up with 80, which I'm not quite sure how that happened because Baypam is usually really good on Columbia's. It doesn't do much for stubbies. Say the whole field got bay pammed, so nematode tests are always kind of a hit and miss, hot spot, cold spot. Like it's really, I don't know of a better way to try to, you know, monitor, put a number on what we have, but it can be really frustrating trying to make decisions based off little probe holes in the ground. So on this one here, like say we have an 80 count of Columbia, nothing else. We came up zero on stubby. This one over here, they are still sitting at a 20 count of stubby. That's telone. Tell, I mean, threshold's virtually nothing for stubby. The, these out here are tobacco, 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 tobacco rattle virus positive. They cause the corky ring spot. So yeah, I mean, one, guys will start to fumigate. You get to 20, that's a big rate of telone. We're looking at 20, 25 gallons of telone the acre usually when they get that far. So we felt pretty good about that one. Um, so this is the one that Mark sent me. This one, remember I told you, we'll come back to viral infections. Ah, it really didn't show up very well. This is um, tomato leaf curl virus, and this was in Georgia, Florida? South Georgia. South Georgia. So this is, this is a death notice. There's nothing, it's a, it's a viral infection. There's nothing you can do with this. You want me to give a one minute synopsis real quick? Please do. I had a distributor down there, an agro distributor, who sells a lot of O2YS. That's much better. Yeah. But um, he, he called me up, and there were four 50 acre blocks of tomatoes. The back two were great sized tomatoes, the front two were rounds. They were all the same exact variety. He said, he called me up, and he goes, The insurance company just left, the crops are totally right off. He goes, I want to try to do a rescue. I'm like, What? He goes, do you mind if we try to do a rescue? And I said, what's it going to cost me? He goes, oh, it's just going to cost you maybe $1,000 for the material. I swear it got fun. I said, okay, do it. He came out there, and they treated three of the four squares. The four squares there on the right. And it, that was after the yellow leaf curl came in, and it just stayed exactly the same way. The other three crops came out above the yellow leaf curl, blew out a monstrous tomato plant and got one of the second largest yields in that county on top of what the insurance company had just written off. University of Georgia came out there and said there's absolutely nothing you can put on this crop that'll help it. Big Chemical came out there. Helena came out there with their reps, said nothing you can do, and that's what they got. And I've got a lot of pictures of that crop, but I mean, those are the type of things that, you know, the end is, I mean, the <coughs> universities and such will say, no, can't do it. We, we took a risk and uh, we pretty much proved it can be done. And uh, it's kind of fun. I'm not allowed to even brag about that because that's so far off label, it's not even funny. But we, we proved it happens a lot. Mark, what, how much did you use? We, used, we used, on that particular crop right there, we used a pint of O2YS, a pint of Nemasan, because I wanted, I said, guys, treat it for nematodes. I said, I don't, if anybody comes out here, and we also used a pint of the foliar plant the agro product. And then we came back two weeks later and did that same exact treatment and that's all we did on that crop and completely came back. And at the time, get this, the grape tomatoes on the back crop, which was the second largest yield in that area, they grow a lot of tomatoes down there. The tomatoes were going for 40 bucks a box. They normally go for $20 a box because, but with all this going on, the price was double. So that farmer right there, he owes me a yacht. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way I see it right now. I haven't seen the guy, but uh, he is. Uh, so, sorry. How much foliar material did you put on a quart? Or is it a pint? 16. We a use pint. a pint of each okay. product each time. Foliar blend? Foliar blend. And then the new sand. The new sand and the O2. So what did the fourth quarter get? 
It didn't get anything, and that's what it looks like. And it never even grew. It never even grew a tomato. No. What if you'd have done that when he'd owe you two yachts? Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think. Uh, <laughs> but I just threw this in here, just to, like say, keep. The, I mean, viral stuff. Like relate this to mosaic in our area here, PVX, PVY. Like it's. It's not a death sentence if you wind up with some hot seed, something or another. Why? You there. guys ever heard of cucurbic crumpler virus? I don't know if that's, he was showing, Ken was showing pictures of watermelons. We had cucurbic crumpler virus and the same thing, watermelons down there. Once again, had not used the product. We came in as a rescue, got an outstanding crop. They had four pickings and it was a write off also. So there, there's other things going on with multiple pathogens that we're yep. seeing. Like with the mosaic, can you put that on while the spuds are growing? Could. So on a viral infection, kytosan isn't necessarily going to kill and treat this. It certainly has some suppression activity against the viral infection. But the cool thing about this, especially if you were in a situation where you had a high infection PVY potato seed you're planting, it will inoculate the rest of the field. Think of this like going and getting your vaccinations. Like it's way easier to get a vaccination for polio ahead of time than it is to get polio and try to live a healthy life, come back after that. So it will actually, like I say, turn things on in the plant and it will actually inoculate it. It will actually kind of vaccinate it against, the, so it doesn't spread as much through the field. For the seed guys and stuff here, why through the, you know, the insecticidal properties of this, the plant health properties of this, the viral suppression aspect of this. The thing we haven't talked about much here today, the O2 is mixed with a product called yucca and it comes, it's a saponin. So, so it, it just makes everything move, spread, float, go. It just is awesome. Wetting agent, everything. If you think along the lines, we've heard like some of the organic guys talk about insecticidal soaps before that they'll put out. This kind of comes along in, in that line of thinking. When you spray this on the leaf surface, it actually will put a film down. It actually will cover the film. So. I, I, there's some success to a limited extent, I guess, some of the guys are playing now with the waxes and stuff, spraying on uh, seed potatoes and whatnot. So to some extent, this will have that same effect for anything that lands on the leaf surface. You have a protective barrier there already for anything that blows in on the wind, as well as, again, the insect repellent properties you're gonna have when you get the chitinase levels build up in this. And if you, again, get the bricks levels up, the insects, first off, don't want to be there. Should they be there, they're going to have a really bad day.